his question is, um, if the Buddha said uh, that the Dhamma is uh, very great uh, and very profound, uh, he compared it to the leaves in the leaves, is it? Uh, leaves in the forest, is it? Uh, then he said, in that case, uh, how can the Dhamma uh, be uh, confined to the four Nikayas? You see? Now, to understand this, uh, like to understand many things in the Dhamma, uh, first you have to study the four Nikayas. Uh. When you understand the four Nikayas, then you will know for yourself. Uh, uh, basically, it's like this. Uh, Buddha is just a human being, you know. Just that he's enlightened. But even though our Buddha is enlightened, uh, he's still very human, you know. Sometimes he likes to joke. Sometimes he can even appear like say the wrong words, you know, say the wrong thing. For example, there was one sutta. He came to a certain town. He had no place to stay. So his relative brought him to stay with one ascetic who was formerly his friend uh, when he was practicing with the external set, ascetic. Nah. So, when he went to stay with this ascetic, at night nah, his relative came to visit him. This relative was a big man nah, in that town of Kapilavatu, a Sakyan, a very well-known Sakyan, a rich man and all that. So, when he came to see the Buddha, then um, the Buddha taught him some Dhamma. La. Then the Buddha asked him a question. La. So the answer is either A or B. La. Okay? So the Buddha asked him a question. So when he was about to reply, eh, this external sect ascetic, he thought he want to sort of, how do you say, um, teach this uh, the Sakyan, the rich Sakyan, so as to be in his favor. La. So he told the Sakyan to reply, for example, A and B. La. He told the Sakyan to reply A. So when he said, told the Sakyan to reply A, the Buddha, I don't know whether jokingly or not, la, told the Sakyan to reply B. So after he thought for a while, he thought maybe his answer is wrong. La. So the Buddha said, reply B. So he told the Sakyan, reply B. La. When the Buddha heard that, the Buddha said, reply A. So he thought for a while, ah, maybe A is right. Nah. Then he told the Sakyan, reply A. Nah. Third time the Buddha said, reply B. Contradict him three times, you know. So he malu, nah. no face, you know. Every time he's wrong. So he felt so bad. Nah. That night, nah, he took up all his things back and ran away. <laughs> So you see, eh, the Buddha is so human, he can, I don't know whether you can call this an error or not, la, but he didn't give the, the, the ascetic any face. <laughs> so sometimes like people say the Buddha is so kind, he never scold. No, he never scold. Sometimes you call his monks a fool, bala, bodo, <laughs> fool, you know. As one sutta, he scolded the Brahmins very badly, you know, compared them to dogs. They're worse than dogs. So, coming back to your question, you see, the Buddha said that um, once he was asked, are all the Buddhas the same? He said, no. Uh, in the sense that, no, he was asked whether the Sasana's long is always very, Sasana's life is always very long. He said, no. He said, the reason is, uh, different Buddhas, uh, they teach different, you know. There are some Buddhas, they speak many suttas. Like, like our Buddha is supposed to be one of the best, you know. Sariputta said, nah, you cannot find a higher Buddha than our Buddha. So, the, the Buddha said, nah, there are some Buddhas who teach a lot of sutta. There are some Buddhas nah, that teach very little, very few suttas, you know. And because they teach very few suttas, and also very little Vinaya, Dhamma Vinaya, the two things, nah, there are some Buddhas teach a lot of Dhamma Vinaya. The Sasana lasts longer, you know, and more people attain. But there are some Buddhas, they teach very little, you know, very little uh, Dhamma Vinaya. So the Sasana does not last very long and less people attain. 
Why? They are all humans. Right? They are just like us. Right? No two persons are the same. You cannot find two, two Buddhas right? exactly the same one. No. So even though the Dhamma is very profound, it, the Buddha is a human being. So his life is limited. How can he speak forever? No. And also up to him, uh, how much he wants to speak. There is a sutta where uh, Ananda asked the Buddha, he said, why is it, uh, Lord? He said, sometimes people come, you speak to them. Some people come, you don't want to speak to them. Why? Then the Buddha said, I look at him. Uh. If he comes, he is interested in the Dharma, uh, he is respectful, I say some words to him. Then if he listen, I say some more. If you don't listen, I keep quiet. <laughs> if he ask me questions, eh, I'll answer him some more. If he don't answer me, ask me questions, I keep quiet. Nah. And then if he is a person, he comes and hear Dharma from me, he goes back, he doesn't practice. Next time he come, I won't speak to him, won't teach him anything. See? So it all depends. Right? Buddha, he look at people and yeah, he teach. Well, Dhamma is very precious, you know. You don't simply uh, give uh, very easily. People don't respect. Uh. Sometimes you give too much Dhamma, uh. people don't respect. You see, for example, when Buddhism first came to China, uh, the first patriarch was supposed to be Bodhidharma. He was a very serious practicing monk. So his disciple, uh, the first disciple uh, who wanted to come and learn from him, they're supposed to be the second patriarch in China, uh, asked him to teach Dhamma. He refused to teach. Uh, asked Bodhidharma to teach. Uh, he thought this fellow not fit for me to teach. Uh, I don't want to teach him. Then this fellow continued to press him so so often. Uh, he said, uh, I won't teach you until the white snow becomes red. Uh. And this fellow went to take a knife, cut his hand, the blood spilled all over the place. The snow became red. Then he came to see Bodhidharma. Then he looked at him. Ah, this fellow really sincere. Then only he taught him Dharma. Nowadays, ah, you give too much Dharma talk, people don't appreciate. Won't come also. <laughs> person attains Sotapanna, it does not mean he has no eye. When a person attains the Sotapanna, three fetters are destroyed now. One is the view of a body in this, uh, of a being in the body, Sakaya Ditti. The view of a being uh, in the body. Because normally uh, we think uh, the body is I. When a person attains the Sotapanna, then he realizes uh, this body is not I. Uh, uh, but there is still an I. Somewhere, it's just like the anagami in the sutta. There's one sutta where some teras, they, they thought uh, a certain monk was an anagami. Actually, he's an anagami. Uh. So these teras, they have not attained any higher stage. So they wanted him to teach. Uh. So they asked him, uh, what's the state of an anagami like? Uh? So he said, uh, the state of an anagami is that he knows uh, that there is no, theoretically, uh, he knows that there is no I, uh, uh, no soul. Uh, but uh, somehow uh, he still has that insight uh, somewhere. Uh, he still has clings to that I. Uh, uh, and then he gave a simile uh, of uh, like uh, I think something like a cloth la, has a certain smell. La. Uh, uh, then he will go and wash it clean. La. After he wash it clean, it's clean of all the dirt. La. But still that little smell persists, you know. A certain smell persists. So, I'm uh, talking about this, uh, whether he knows he's got this, uh, he's a sotapan all the time. Uh, he, 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 it's only when he contemplates only he knows. It doesn't, he, I don't think that he knows all the time that he's also found. In the sutta, there's a simile given of a person uh, whose hand is cut. Uh, he's got no hand. But uh, 
when he's not thinking that he's got no hand, he does not realize he's got no hand, you know. You use your left hand to shake hands with him, uh, he'll come out with his <laughs> arm. Uh, actually, he's got no arm. You see? Uh, it's only when he thinks, uh, ah, actually, I have no, no left hand. I have to use my right hand. The important thing uh, is to study the suttas. As I said, uh, try to buy the four nikayas and study it again and again. And after some time, uh, you have a certain understanding of the sutta. Then the Buddha said there are four things uh, that if you have, uh, you can be quite sure uh, that you have entered the stream and won't fall into the woeful plains. Uh. One, you have unshakable faith. Uh, you have uh, you have sadha, uh, you have strong confidence uh, or faith in the Buddha. You have a uh, strong confidence uh, or trust uh, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha. And then your five precepts uh, are quite pure. Uh. If you have these things, uh, you can be quite... Uh, provided you, you, you have that understanding of the Sutta, uh, of the discourses. It mentioned uh, that you need to study all the four Nikayas and uh, relate them lah, because the suttas, uh, you cannot take one sutta and say this is the absolute truth as I mentioned in my previous talk in Ipo I say one sutta uh, will explain the truth uh, from one angle another sutta will explain the truth from another angle the more suttas you read uh, then you will see uh, from various angles and you will understand better lah. for example I did mention in uh, the Ipo talk uh, that some people think uh, just by studying the Satipatthana Sutta, you know all about Satipatthana. You don't. You know. In the Sangyutta Nikaya, there are very many uh, important suttas that deal with Satipatthana. And even that is not all. In the Diga Nikaya, again you have, uh, and the Majima Nikaya, again you have suttas uh, that deal with Satipatthana. So, unless you study all these suttas, you might come to some wrong conclusions. For example, I mentioned earlier, there is one sutta that says uh, samatha, tranquilization, will give you uh, will give you concentration, which in turn will make you abandon lust. And then it also says that vipassana, contemplation, will give you wisdom. And so, you, from this sutta alone, uh, you might think uh, that samatha only gives you concentration and vipassana is the one that gives you uh, wisdom. But you can find another sutta which says uh, almost the opposite. Uh, the, that Namely, that a bright mind, uh, if you cultivate your samadhi, your concentration so strong until your mind becomes very bright, uh, that is the best condition uh, for insight. In other words, samadhi here will give you wisdom. And then it says, uh, contemplation on the 32 parts of the body will make you abandon lust. So just now there it says, uh, concentration makes you abandon lust. Here it says, uh, contemplation makes you abandon lust. Quite the opposite. So, you can only reconcile this uh, by understanding that samatha and vipassana must work together. You cannot separate them. To separate them uh, is to misunderstand because, uh, as I mentioned in my previous talk, there's one sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, I think 149, that says that when you cultivate the Aryan Eightfold Path, uh, and you develop it fully, uh, automatically uh, all the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas uh, are developed fully, namely the four Satipatthana, the four Samapadana, the four right efforts, the four Idipada, the five Bala, the five Indriya, the seven Bojanga, the eight uh, factors of the Aryan Four Path. All these uh, automatically uh, are developed uh, when you develop the Aryan Eightfold Path. And it also adds uh, that uh, when all these are fully developed, then Samatha and Vipassana work together. They are led to work together, Samatha and Vipassana. 
So how can you separate them? Cultivated the mind until the hindrances are cleared. Then, you see, uh, this attainment uh, depends on your level of jhana you attain. See, the sutapana does not need jhana, according to the sutta, right? They just hear the dhamma and they attain. Whereas the sakadagami, they need a lower level. They may not have all the four jhanas, maybe they have one jhana, and then they suppress the sensual lust and the and the ill will. But the anagami must have the four jhana, the arahan must have the four jhana. That is extremely rare. Uh, and either that person has already developed the four jhanas uh, this lifetime or previous lifetime. You see, uh, for example, in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha said uh, that if you practice Satipatthana, you will either attain anagami or arahanhood uh, in seven years, six years five years, down to seven days, you know. The minimum now uh, was mentioned was seven days, right? Yet, uh, if you study the Vinaya, you find uh, that the six Arahan, uh, the Buddha helped to enlighten, uh, the number six uh, after the five bhikkhus, uh, was a monk called Yasa. And this Yasa was a person uh, who had very great paramis. Uh, uh, he must have already done a lot of cultivation in his past life. Because uh, in the Vinaya, what happened was, the Buddha sort of, uh, somehow I think the Buddha used his psychic power to make this Yasa come to him. This Yasa was like the Buddha. He was from a very well-to-do family. So he was surrounded by slaves and, and women who, 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 uh, uh, who attended to him all the time. So one night, uh, when all these uh, attendants, uh, slaves and musicians and all that uh, fell asleep, uh, in the middle of the night he woke up, maybe by the help of the Buddha. In uh, the middle of the night he woke up, then he looked around him, uh, all these slaves and all these women are uh, lying around uh, like corpses. Uh, because uh, these people in India, when people are dead, uh, they throw into the jungle and the animals will eat them. So it's not uncommon uh, to see corpses. Uh, so when he saw all these slaves, all these women uh, sleeping around him, uh, some with their mouth open, some with the saliva coming down, and some snoring and all that, and he looked at the hair all. So he looked at them, they really looked like corpses. Uh. So he, because of past cultivation, uh, this thing uh, impressed him as Dukkha, you know. So he said to himself, Dukkha, Dukkha. So he was disgusted, he didn't want to stay there. He walked out of his big mansion, uh, Walk out, and then I think probably the Buddha or Devas help him uh, to go into the jungle uh, to see the Buddha. So when he went to see the Buddha, he was saying dukkha dukkha. The Buddha said, "Come here, yes, sir, come here. There's no dukkha here." So when he heard that uh, there's no dukkha, quickly he was very happy to come near the Buddha. So when he sat near the Buddha, the Buddha talked to him Dhamma. When the Buddha talked to him Dhamma, very soon uh, he became a sotapan stated in the Vinaya. So after he attained uh, stream entry, after that, he stayed with the Buddha. Then the next day, his uh, father was worried for him. So his father went out looking for him, thought what happened to him, because probably he comes from such a rich family, eh? he thought he was kidnapped or something. So his father uh, went out of the city gates, la, and went looking for him, and then found his slippers along the way found his slippers and then uh, his father started walking, walking and then came to the Buddha also. And the Buddha used his psychic power and um, asked the father to sit down. The father said he was looking for his son. Buddha made him uh, sit, ask him to sit down, but used his psychic power to block the son from his view, you know. Although the son was sitting beside the Buddha, the father couldn't see him. So the Buddha said, sit here, sit down here. Maybe you will find your son so when he heard the Buddha say, maybe I'll find my son, he thought this is a holy man, nah. can't be lying. Nah. So he sat down there. Then the Buddha spoke Dharma to him. When the Buddha spoke Dharma to him, nah, he became a Sotapan. And at the same time as his son was hearing the Dharma, his son became an Arahan. 
So this is one of the rare cases that uh, somebody come to the come to hear the Dhamma two days only uh, became an arahan. Uh, this kind of rare case uh, is not the general case. Uh, is the is a is the exception. You see, so. There are always exceptions, but the the thing is, you cannot use exceptions uh, to make the rule. Yes, no? The rule is that the general rule is that, for example, a person must cultivate the Aryan Eightfold Path, yes, no? uh, and all the eight factors must be there, including the four jhanas. But if somebody has already cultivated maybe very high jhanas up to Arupa jhanas in the previous life, uh, when he comes into this life, uh, his mind is very clear, you know. This is a kind of uh, translation uh, which attempts to get at the meaning of the word. Uh, but it's not a literal translation, so it's not a very good translation. You know, the word yoni uh, means the womb. It also means the source. It also means the starting point. So when you say yoni so, uh, it means uh, down to the womb or down to the starting point, or maybe up to the starting point. Uh, up to the source, lah. Okay. So when you say manisikara means consideration, lah. So when you say yoni so manasikara, it means you are able to consider the problem, lah, right up to the very source, the starting point of the problem. You know. Now to able to consider uh, the problem uh, up to the starting point, uh, it consists of many many steps, you know, right? So unless your mind is very strong, you start thinking of this problem. Uh, you consider, consider. Say, for example, there are ten steps. Uh, you 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 think three steps. Uh, after that, your mind is sidetracked. You start thinking of your home. Your wife said something to you this morning. <laughs> then you start to come back. You, your mind is not strong. It cannot lead you right up to the source of the problem. Whereas a person now uh, with strong samadhi, because his concentration is very good, when he thinks of a problem. Uh, he can follow uh, the, the 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 line uh, of argument or the the the, the, the steps uh, up to the very source. Then he can understand the problem. That's why yoniso manasikara. You cannot have it uh, unless uh, you have a composed mind, a certain amount of samadhi. In fact, it's the same with sati. Sati uh, is defined in about eight suttas. There are eight suttas uh, that define sati uh, in long words. You know. And it actually means uh, being able to remember what you said and you did a long time ago. That is the real definition of sati. So people translate it as mindfulness. As I said in my earlier talk, uh, if by mindfulness uh, you mean uh, being able to remember, uh, that is perfectly correct. But if you think uh, that mindfulness uh, means uh, when the uh, form comes, I must know what it is. When the sound comes, I have to observe the sound, I know the sound. Uh, when the smell comes, taste, touch and all these things. Uh, that is not mindfulness, you know. Mindfulness, uh, in this case of sati, uh, a better uh, translation uh, is actually recollectedness, you know, or composure, you know, a composed mind, a recollected mind. Recollected means, uh, recollectedness uh, means uh, you are able to recollect, like, that is precisely the meaning of sati, you know, you are able to recollect. So, uh, in one of the suttas, somebody asked the Buddha, why is it uh, I cannot remember some of the chants? Uh, I practiced many times, uh, I learned so long, I still cannot remember it. And the Buddha said the reason is because of the five hindrances. When you have five hindrances, you cannot remember things. So, it's only when you get rid of the five hindrances, you can remember. Ah, then you will understand. Actually, to have sati, eh, to be able to remember, you have to get rid of the hindrances. If you don't get rid of the hindrances, you don't have sati. So, sometimes uh, these translations, uh, we take the translation to be correct. Uh, it might not be correct. That's why actually to really understand the Buddha's words, uh, you have to learn some Pali. You know, and then check the translation. Is it correct or not correct? This uh, sati eh, is a quality, you know. Sati is a quality. The quality of being able to remember. And as I mentioned just now, you can only remember well eh, if your five hindrances 
are abandoned. In other words, sati is an indication of some level of concentration. So, as I said just now, when your mind is concentrated, then you are automatically mindful. If you don't have that concentration, you try to be mindful, you cannot be mindful all the time. You are only trying to be mindful. But you cannot do it away with mindfulness also. Before you have that concentration, you need that mindfulness, that practice of mindfulness, that persistent practice of mindfulness that will eventually develop into concentration. Okay? If you continue being mindful, it must develop into concentration. And that concentration in turn will support your mindfulness. So you cannot separate these two. Mindfulness and concentration, they, they, they support each other. I just explained just now, the purpose of having, being able to recollect is to have that strength of mind. Uh, this, as I said just now, sati is a quality, you know. If you want to recollect, you can. Ah. <laughs> the Buddha never asked us to recollect all the bad experience. The Buddha said, uh, in the practice of sati, only four things you must be mindful of. Only four things, you know. The body, the feelings, the mind, and the Buddha's teaching, the Dhamma. Only four things. Don't be mindful of any other thing. If you run away from these four things, uh, the Buddha said, you are going into Mara's ground, Mara can catch you. So it's only these four things. That's why even these four things, uh, the Buddha never said to practice all these four things at once. The Buddha said practice one at a time. And when you practice one, if you practice it correctly, it must give you one pointedness of mind. Because one pointedness of mind will make you see things as they really are. So, samatha and vipassana, they are related. They, just like mindfulness and concentration, they support each other. The Buddha said, uh, when you contemplate on these four things, uh, it is not thinking uh, about these four things. But, uh, when you don't have concentration, if you don't have concentration, uh, this is what you tend to do. Uh, you tend to think about these four things. So initially, uh, it might be okay. Uh, but that is not higher, high wisdom, you know. Because the Buddha said if we use our thinking mind, that is a lower kind of wisdom. What the Buddha was trying to tell us uh, was to cultivate the higher mind. And the higher mind uh, is to develop the jhana so that your mind uh, is lifted to a higher level. And when you contemplate on something, uh, you understand something uh, sort of intuitively. Uh. Straight away you know. Uh, it's just like the Buddha, they want to know something, uh, they don't go and think about it. And the Arahants want to know something, uh, they just incline their mind to something, straight away they know. And it's not thinking, that's intuitive wisdom. So that is the purpose of meditation, to bring our mind to a higher level, so that when we contemplate something, uh, we can really perceive it in depth. In depth. If we start thinking, uh, it's just uh, the shallow part. In fact, if we meditate, uh, if we practice uh, meditation and your concentration grows, uh, you will get the feeling uh, that you are going inside your mind. You are going deeper and deeper inside your mind. And our mind uh, is like uh, is something hard in you know? it. And uh, something hard, say, like ice. Like. If you try to get inside the ice, you cannot. Right? You have to cultivate your mind uh, until it becomes softer. When it becomes softer, then you slowly you can penetrate deeper and deeper. And uh, if you can penetrate deeper, uh, it means you are opening up your mind. And depending on how much you open up your mind, uh, that is the depth of level uh, of wisdom you will get. If, say, the mind uh, can be opened up so much, uh, say 10 feet, just for example, the mind can be opened up 10 feet. If you just open up your mind uh, half a foot, uh, then when you contemplate something, uh, your understanding uh, is so shallow.
have a good money. But if you can open your mind, say five feet, then uh, when you contemplate something, your understanding uh, goes deeper. It's more profound. 